Hi, welcome back. This is Jeff Ray again. Today I sat down with a longtime friend of mine, Greg Lindberg. Uh, we recorded uh, some segments for his podcast and uh, decided to record this and uh, post it. So uh, first part of this is a little bit f- uh, for his podcast and then I chimed in towards the end and uh, started asking him some questions. Um, have a look and uh, enjoy. I was born in uh, Tampa, Florida, and uh, I was raised in Palm Harbor. I actually grew up in the same neighborhood that you did. Um, we lived down the street from each other, and I think we met when we were um, what, like two or three years old. I don't remember the venue. Yeah, maybe three. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the venue that we actually met in. Uh, but... Right. I think I might have been in a wagon or something, and I don't know if you yeah. were, but it was on the street, I believe. Yeah, oh, okay. our parents' mothers kind of ran into each other. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we grew up in a, a neighborhood uh, in Palm Harbor. And uh, I believe, yeah, we went to uh, elementary school together. Now, keep in mind, we were in all separate classes. Um, we were too right. feisty. We were too feisty, I think, to put in the same class. Too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> double duo. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so we were in uh, separate classes uh, all the way through elementary school, and then I believe we branched out and went to different middle schools. I went to um, Carwise. I had a family member um, that was there uh, working. So like, I got like a special waiver to go there. We you went to Coachman. So, and then right. we kind of all, yeah. And then we all kind of reconvened back in high school. And again, uh, um, you know, we had, we, we had separate classes, but I believe we had a few classes together, um, like computers and English and uh, other other um, classes that we were in. And uh, then I went off to college and got a degree in computer information systems and stayed a little bit longer for MBA. And I think you went to uh St. Pete College, got your associates, and then you went to USF, so. Yep, USF St. Pete, and then, uh, yeah, also got a master's in journalism there, bachelor's in mass communication. So, yeah, we, uh, we, we've been friends for a long time, and, uh, kind of been, uh, I guess we can call it confidants in terms of sticking together. I mean, we both have some um, um, obstacles that we have to overcome. And I think that that maybe kept this friendship going because we, you kind of helped me out on a few things and I help you out on a few <laughs> things. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, <clears throat> I would be your uh, um, eyes and you would, you know, help me out on other, other things. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's kind of worked pretty well. Just, you know, we yeah. each have our own strengths and I think they've kind of complemented each other. So it's definitely worked out in a lot of ways. So one ironic thing I, I have to mention is I, I moved over to uh, Dade City, got married, moved over to Dade City. And then, Greg, I think you were you were looking for a job. And um, after many interviews, you arrived at St. Leo University and um you were basically, you know, a four minute drive around the corner when you moved there. So it was kind of like um, I moved to this no name town that <laughs> you were making fun of me for moving to that no one knows of Dade City. And then you show up and it's basically like old, old times there, you know? Exactly. Definitely. Just, you know, in a million years, who would have thought the two of us would have ended up in that small town, you know, with a population of no more than say 7,000. Yep. Yep. (laughs) So. (laughs) Definitely ironic. Yeah. Uh, So let's, uh, let's just kind of talk about our, our challenges and, I know I've mentioned, you know, on this podcast about how I am visually impaired and and legally blind and whatnot. And if you don't mind just sharing about your, you know, your, your condition, your challenges and kind of what you've dealt with. Yeah. So I was born with uh, what they call hyperglossa, hyperdactyly syndrome. So basically it affects both my hands and my feet. And I also had some, uh, um, 
oral problems, uh, all congenital uh, uh, defects. Uh, none of them are in any of my uh, ancestry. Uh, so it just it just happened. And um, so I was born with a, a club foot on my right leg, and um, I had a missing foot on my left and missing digits on both my hands. So I have uh, two fingers on each of my hands, and I had... Uh, my 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 tongue was basically lodged in my the roof of my mouth, so uh, they had to perform some surgery when I was like two weeks old to remove or extract my tongue so that it wouldn't, as I grew, it wouldn't cause any more problems. So it was easier to you know fix the problem when you're that small. So when you grow up, it doesn't turn into a larger problem. <clears throat> and right. then. The um, club foot was fixed at Schranger's. Um, so luckily I was born in the Tampa Bay area and we had a, um, a guy at our church. We went to the same church. Uh, we both did. And uh, his name was uh, John Shoskin. And he was a Schranger. And uh, so everybody at church kind of knew what was going on. And he put in a recommendation. I believe at that time, Shriner, if you had to be recommended by a shrine uh, or hmm. Shriner to go there. <clears throat> and I went there and I uh, met with, uh, I think he's now retired, but he used to be chief of staff there um, towards the end of my tenure there. His name is Dr. Dennis Grogan. And he's an orthopedic surgeon. And basically, they kind of laid out a, a plan to attack you know, my hands and my feet. Um, they're basically a, an orthopedic and burn hospital. Uh, so obviously I was on the uh, orthopedic uh, side of things. And uh, so they performed corrective surgery on my club foot. And basically I have a fused ankle. So I have to wear a brace around. Uh, I don't have to, but I choose to use a brace around my leg to kind of prevent the uh, instabilities in the ankle um, just provide that extra layer of protection there and then they uh, made some prosthetic leads for me so I've had braces and prosthetics provided by Shriners Hospital all the way up to when I was 18 so I probably had you know, like 15 to 20 uh, apparatuses if you will <clears throat> wow quite a few yeah and uh, they did some bone lengthening on my fingers so that I could be able to hold pencils and just do normal everyday tasks. So um, I, I tell people that I'm I'm just like you. I uh, the only thing I can't do is flick you off. I can't uh, <laughs> snap my fingers and I can't st uh, stick my tongue out. But um, I'm just a normal dude. I can drive a car. I took pilots flying lessons when I was yeah what, like 13 years old. Um, and uh, most recently, I went went to a shooting range, so I, I do have uh, a concealed carry permit in Florida, which is uh, an interesting story of how I got that. And maybe that's for <laughs> a, a different different uh, time to to share that. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. Let's uh, talk about you know just us growing up and kind of some of the challenges that we both face, say in school and. I know myself, you know, the, the big thing always was, you know, kids asking me, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? And can you see me? Can you see this, that just, you know, kind well, of always picking on me in that way. That was, you know, for me being visually impaired was kind of the big, uh, the big thing I got from other students. Well, with me, you only have a, a 50% chance of getting the answer right. I could hold up one <laughs> finger or the other finger. I may, well, maybe it, <clears throat> Maybe a third, you know, because I could True. hold up no finger. So, you know. Right. right. <laughs> uh, but yeah. anyway, so you have a higher probability of getting it right with me versus the other kids. But anyway, I, I, I didn't do that with you. Um, you know, I, I kind of watch out for you. Uh, but Definitely, yeah. Uh, growing, growing up, um, I, I think your vision got kind of progressively worse as you as you grew up, if I remember right. Um, right. So I remember like riding bikes with you in the neighborhood. That was like one of our things. We, we'd come home from school. We would call each other on the phone, go ride bikes around the neighborhood, hang out with the neighborhood kids. And, and if that sounds foreign to you, you're probably a, a, a millennial who uh, 
<laughs> sits behind a computer screen and chats with people on Facebook. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. No sunshine. No outdoor yeah. activities. Just. But yeah. we actually like we we made forts. Uh, we had a fort in our backyard. Um, True. We had, down the road, there was a kid or a group of kids that had forts and kind of a wooded area behind their house. And we would go over there and climb up trees and build things and, and uh, <laughs> just have fun. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, as far as neighborhood kids, you know, I feel like obviously any neighborhood is going to have some bad apples or whatnot. But, you know, despite our disabilities and challenges, we still connected pretty well with other kids around us and and whatnot, you know, at least in terms of the neighborhood. Yeah, I, I remember a time where um, <laughs> both you and I got picked on a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's one kid and uh kind of the policy on my 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 youtube channel i don't name names i just tell stories right <clears throat> so um there was a kind of a brother duo that um one was a few years older than the other and uh the older brother we 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 found a creative game for him and we <laughs> went around and asked people in the neighborhood if they thought he was whatever that name was and uh <clears throat> well the mother got a hold of that and uh rushed down to both our houses and uh and basically scolded our parents and then once <laughs> once the door was shut we got high fives from our parents so <clears throat> exactly <laughs> um kind of a kinda... taste of his own medicine type thing and uh exactly you know, <laughs> kind of just showed yeah you know the fact that they were totally behind us our parents i mean they could obviously see that okay oh, yeah. there was just yeah. somebody else that was picking on us and yeah. it was not right so we had every right to do a little something funny i mean it was nothing bad or anything no, just no. have some you know making a joke out of it and, and having some fun with it i think we we called him a cow or something like that and the mother right. took offense to it and uh i mean it wasn't even a profane <laughs> word it was just you know oh yeah i mean think of all the things. exactly all the potential thing, other things we could have yeah. called them so <laughs> yeah so um yeah we rode bikes a lot and uh I believe yeah we were in all different classes so we didn't have any like similar homework or anything like that um so, and I think, yeah, we hung out a lot. I know you went on cruises on, in the summer and, and, uh, and we basically hang out basically a few hours every day. So, oh, yeah. At each other houses or just, you know, whatever. Yeah. Occasionally working on, you know, once in a while we would have a similar class in high school yeah. or yeah. even before that and might have some similar assignments and kind of, you know, work on that stuff together. Yep. So, um, Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I know we talked about, you know, kind of just what other, how kind of others, you know, perceived us and, um, you know, I would say looking back, sure, there, there were bullies and I think you're going to have that no matter who you are, no matter what shape, size, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Everyone's going to get picked on, I feel like at some point, you know, especially growing up as, as a kid or whatnot. Um, and for us, you know, having a disability, obviously you're a little more of a target for that. So it's, it's just going to happen. Um, so I guess kind of advancing forward, uh, you know, thinking back to say elementary and middle school, it seems like that's kind of when I had more, you know, more of the, the bullying, if you want to call it that, or just getting picked on. But I, I feel like once I got to high school, it was a little, less you know there wasn't quite as much of it i mean it was still kind of a rough age you know with teenagers but it uh it, it did kind of die down I, I at least for me a little bit yeah i i think the the student population in our high school um we knew some of the kids from elementary school so they kind of knew what what was up and what we were all about so um <clears throat> i think see my disability or I like to call it uh, um, anomalies or whatever you want to you know <laughs> apply to it I don't think it has a, a disability because it doesn't disable me from doing anything I just find right. create find creative solutions and creative ways to adapt to you know whatever I'm, I'm doing and adaption is kind of also kind of a uh, an interesting word um, adapting kind of means that you were in a state before that you were doing something and then 
had to change your way of doing that to quote adapt to do something so i just just learned how to do it my way right <clears throat> yeah and i can definitely relate you know as someone who's visually impaired just you know like you said there you can pretty much do everything except a few things and i'm you know similar in a lot of ways that aside from being able you know being able to see certain things well or driving or whatnot i can still pretty much do anything just in a different way yep so um to answer your question about uh school and, and growing up with that um kind of the big thing in, in elementary school was the pe class so um i know we had a we had similar um pe teachers but one of the big thing was run around this bus loop and the class had to wait for everybody to get done and we go do something so naturally i'd be the last one to you know finish or you know you go play soccer or baseball or whatever they're setting up on the pe um courts and fields and you have a team captain and they have to choose what people you know went on certain teams or you know they got to pick their team if you will yep and i was always the last one or the one that the pe teacher had to decide what team to go on right. and and that was difficult and i know i had a couple trips to the uh principal's office over that um not that i acted out i i i saw that there was um a uh some issues going on that I think a principal should know in terms of how uh, certain staff members were conducting, you know, that type of scenario. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, <clears throat> I can definitely relate. I mean, I will say my vision was a little better back then and I really did not use a white cane, you know, at that point. Um, so, you know, like, I guess we kind of talked about before just, you know, a visible quote unquote disability versus an invisible one. You know, I, you know, might've had thicker glasses and maybe it was a little obvious, you know, that I couldn't see too well, but it wasn't quite as <clears throat> obvious or, or glaring or whatnot, you know, as maybe somebody else. Um, so that, you know, fortunately I, you know, I, I did have some of that, like you said about teams, you know, being picked for a team or whatnot. And, Sometimes, you know, I would, you know, people would kind of go down the line and then, okay, let's have Greg at the end or so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can definitely relate on that front too. Yeah, yeah. So, like, one thing that uh, I noticed uh, about me personally is when I got to high school, kind of that whole, I would say that bullying kind of stopped in front of me. Uh, but there was a lot of back channeling going on. So, like, people would get invited to parties. The whole class would get invited to a party, and I'd be the one left out. And exactly, I I would end up figuring it out because I knew some of the other kids that were invited, and you know they were off doing whatever. And um, of course, I, I didn't crash anybody's party or anything like that. But you know, it, that was something that kind of hurt. You know that they invited everybody in the class or the majority of the class and you're the one out and uh you know it it um for lack of a better term it messed with my head a lot in <laughs> terms of what was i doing wrong uh is it something i'm doing wrong or is it something that they're like visually you know they just don't want to associate with me um so all, all of that kind of you know, mess with me a little bit, but I found outlets to, um, um, I, I found various outlets, like one was uh, doing computer repair and, you know, uh, computer work that I could pour my effort into there to kind of focus my attention elsewhere and not really care about what they were doing. Right. And I thought it was interesting what you said about just kind of the, you know, the, Maybe not backhanded compliment, but just, a, you know, kind of bullying in a different way. I mean, when you're, say, a preteen or pretty young, it's, you know, it's more obvious as far as picking on somebody. But once you're, say, a teenager, you know, you're kind of in that starting to date age, whatnot, and it, it, it does kind of change, you know, like you were saying, just yeah. not being included in parties or, you know, it wasn't just someone in a class coming up to you and making a comment necessarily, 
I mean, maybe that would have, you know, happened here and there, but it was more subtle or more yeah. done in a different way. So it, it did kind of change. And I can definitely relate to that, too. Yeah. And then um, I, I would say as I went to college, kind of all that kind of most of it disappeared um, in terms of being excluded. Um, now, there were some other things that, uh, so, you know, there's obviously other things that fill that, that void there of that, you know, not being included. So I actually, I, I made an effort, I joined a fraternity and, um, you know, I, I was the one in the fraternity that didn't drink and was always reliable at pick people up late at night and, you know, be their designated driver and, you know, but that was a choice I had. Was I was like, going to focus on my studies or get drunk and, and party, <laughs> party it up, right? Exactly. Um, so most of the kids in college I, I associated with, they were all in the business school. I was in the math and computer science department. And so I, I would venture to say I had a little bit more rigorous uh, uh, academic uh, schedule than some of the general business majors did so i had a lot of homework and uh <laughs> our projects to complete so yeah and in my case it uh you know i joined the student newspaper which was a great experience just you know making friends connections through that and uh, we didn't really have fraternities or whatnot but you know there were activities just you know social activities campus activities going on on campus that i could get involved in and kind of like you i really noticed a difference i mean from you know elementary to middle middle to high it was you know a little kind of baby steps but i feel like from high school to college it, there was a big difference in just how others perceived you how they communicated with you how they interacted with you mm -hmm. and it really it was refreshing just and also living in the dorm i got to live in the dorm for two years and having those roommates and just you know folks who live around me i mean it really I could really sense, you know, even though a lot of times college kids get a bad rap and they're crazy and like you said, get drunk or whatever part, you know, big party animals. I still got the sense that I was much more accepted and that they, you know, were more willing to include me and interact with me, you know, much more so than, than previously. Yeah. So I, I think that <clears throat> when, uh, kind of towards my senior year uh, of college, um, I, 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 I certainly think that living on campus really helped. Um, For and sure. I think And I think that being a constant presence around people uh, kind, of, kind of helped. Um, so I, I know that uh, towards the end of college, I moved to like an apartment off campus uh, to do my master's program, and that kind of like I I had a sense of freedom, independence, if you will. Uh, but kind of leaving that sense of community kind of created a void and um, some some levels of depression kind of set in, right. and um, that's <clears throat> some. It's something I'm, I'm, you know, I struggle. I'll be the first to admit I struggle with depression and I'm on antidepressants and there's nothing wrong with it. All right. So um, I know there's a lot of stigma around depression and, you know, mental health and admitting that you have a, an issue. Um, and I think that that is a, a constant problem in today's society. What do you think? Definitely. Yeah. And I will say I have taken medication for several years myself. And like you said, it's it's very common, you know, whether someone has a disability or not, everyone has something. Everyone has some kind of struggle, challenge, stress, whatever it is in their lives. Some of us, unfortunately, have more of that than others. And, you know, there's so many factors and reasons for that. And I'm totally with you. It's there's no shame in it. You know, there absolutely should be no shame in in that, you know, any kind of counseling, medication, whatever kind of, you know, meditation, any any kind of activities that can better that can improve or, or at least maintain, you know, decent mental health. I mean, it's it's so important to take care of yourself and look after your well-being and 
you know, if, if you are struggling out there and for whatever reason, I mean, seek help. It's, it's available. It's, you know, very, very helpful, very beneficial. And I'll be the first one to also say it was, it was a struggle make, you know, taking that step and admitting that I did need that help and, you know, yes. just thinking, Oh my God, I, am I, you know, do I have like a serious mental issue? You know, is this like something that's going to affect me in such a negative way for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be considered like this nutcase and, you know, by taking this medication or getting counseling or, yeah. and I, I learned that that's so not true. And I, you know, I think there's a lot of stereotype, you know, stereotyping that goes on still to this day and, and a lot of taboo around that subject but you know there's absolutely no shame in, in getting help yep and um <clears throat> you know recently i uh, about two years ago I, I i sought help from a licensed mental health counselor and uh just having someone there in your corner um to offload what's going on um so your friends don't get bothered by you, <laughs> but but having having good friends around is is very important too. And um, just want to thank you, Greg, for 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 being there. Um, about two years ago, I I I actually two years ago to the day I left my marital home and um, and um, separated from my wife and, and child. Um, there was a lot of uh discernment that led, led up to that decision and uh it's for the best for the best for both of us and our child um i think we we we, we do have a healthy relationship in terms of raising the child and going on from there but you know having a good group of friends having good solid friends that you can you can call on day or night now i didn't wake you up at like two in the morning when this happened but <laughs> <clears throat> um you know, just to be the ear there and, and listen um, is, is also very helpful. And, um, you know, so find good friends that can, yeah, you can lean on and that they can lean on you um, and bounce their struggles off of. Yeah. And I got to say, you know, likewise, right back at you. Just I appreciate your friendship and willingness to talk and, you know, about anything. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, it's, I, I feel like a lot of people look at, say, you know, Facebook, how many Facebook friends do you have? They look at that number. Yeah. And to me, it's so meaningless. I mean, you could have two or three really good friends yep. versus, you know, maybe 30 people that you call friends and maybe occasionally see here, here and there. But to me, it's all about having a, a close circle of really, you know, good friends who truly care and are truly going to be there for you. And, you know, there are, there are a lot of ways that you can make those connections. You know, if someone's listening to this or watching this yep. and is looking to, you know, maybe make new friends or whatnot. I mean, there's so many platforms and outlets for that. And if, even if, even if it's just one other person that you can find that you can really connect with and, and support each other. I mean, it's so much more meaningful than having, you know, quote unquote, you know, a thousand friends on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. So, um, kind of, kind of from my, my background around like 2014, I, I, I was living at home working, uh, uh, in a family business and I, uh, kind of had this epiphany around <laughs> Valentine's Day of 2014 that, hey, I'm lonely and I need to go out. I need to change something about myself, meet some people. And uh, so I signed up for a few like meetup groups online and checked them out. And I, I know, you know, from someone that has, you know, a disability or um, anomaly, as I call them, it's hard to break out of that shell of, you know, being being secure at home and kind of insulating yourself from the outside world. So um, <clears throat> so I, I found different venues to kind of reach out and meet people. One was through Meetup and the other one was through church and, uh, and you know, getting involved in a men's group. Uh, Greg, so uh, what, what are some of the things that you – do to uh, try to break out of that insulate, insulated shell uh, and meet people. 
Yeah, I uh, I know. Speaking of meetup, there was a group at one point a couple years ago. Uh, it was actually like an adults with disabilities group, and I actually went to a few of those meetups. And you know, it was it was interesting because you had such a variety of you know individuals with different challenges. And but it was again just cool to make those connections and kind of be you know being able to relate to others who maybe don't have, you know, the exact same disability or challenges you're dealing with, but you can at least talk to about that. Um, also, I've been involved in the uh, American Council of the Blind, the Florida Council of the Blind, and the Pinellas Council of the Blind, which are all under ACB. And uh, so I've been involved in that organization for about six years now. And that's been a huge help in terms of connecting with other visually impaired individuals you know, not only locally, but at the state level and nationally. And, you know, again, people of all ages, abilities, backgrounds, you know, from college age students to retirees, but pretty much all dealing with some form of visual impairment. And I've gotten so many, you know, I've made so many great connections through that organization and friendships and just learning about technology, you know, sports, I mean, there've been it's 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 been such a great thing to be involved in again, just for that support, and and just really meeting people and and making those connections. Now you actually played in the World Series, right? Yeah, so I do play <clears throat> beat baseball, which I've talked about on this podcast. And so there's uh, it's an association. It's called the NBBA, the National Beat Baseball Association. And so they've been around about 45 years now, since the early 70s. And so they have uh, regional tournaments, and then they have a World Series annually uh, throughout the country. It, it varies, you know, each year it's a different city. So, yeah, I've uh, had an opportunity to play on a couple different teams, some in Florida, one out of Athens, Georgia. And, uh, again, just the support, the camaraderie, you know, just the, the team building and the relationships that you can get out of something like that, really invaluable. I mean, it's just, I, you know, cannot put into words how much I enjoy playing in that, not only just the actual game, but just the teammates and being able to cheer each other on and support each other. And it just, you know, I, I, I just wish, you know, I know there are activities and maybe similar sports or, or events or whatnot for others, you know, with other disabilities. But I, I just wish I could really put into words how, you know, how powerful, how meaningful being involved in something like this sport, this type of event really is and how positive it is just, you know, how much of a positive impact it has on myself and everybody around me. Yeah. It's awesome. And I know like you've, <laughs> you played in like that many years and, it's actually kind of funny. Uh, your your university that you work for actually puts on a, a, a beat baseball uh, tournament uh, every, every yeah. year, and that was actually formed before you even went there. So like you showed up and you're like, "What's this all about?" Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's they've been doing it for probably over 15 years now, and I, I'm thinking, how the heck did they even know about beat baseball? Yeah, which is still such a niche sport. And it's just, yeah, I mean, that connection, you know, at where I work, it just, it's, it really just nailed it home. Like, wow, this is amazing. Yep. Yep. So let's talk about work a little bit. Um, I, I don't really have any interesting stories in terms of, uh, of, uh, applying for employment or, or, or going out and working, uh, for somebody else. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about me. I work in a family business, and uh, it's a computer software business. So I actually uh, I grew up around this stuff, and I just kind of got, you know, put into this position. I went to Stetson University, got a degree in computer information systems, got an MBA, and then, you know, around that time I graduated, um, we started up this current company I'm at, and I'm one of the principal software engineers, and. Uh, I build uh, back-end web server applications and, uh, and mobile apps. So uh, I don't have really any, any interesting interview stories or anything like that. 
and uh, but I know that you've been on many interviews and you've seen how how rough it is out there mm. to to go in an interview with some type of disability and how uh, certain th- even though there's you know the EEOC equal opportunity uh, uh, employment um, that everybody says they follow I know there's some prejudice out there um, that, that sneaks into interviews uh, so kind of tell me some some things about that sure yeah I uh, so after I finished with my master's <clears throat> in journalism back in 2011 uh, it took me a good year and a half to actually f- get a full-time job and uh, so I did do you know some freelance writing and it's mainly you know content writing content marketing social media uh, that kind of thing that I've done in my career um, so I did do a little of that you know before I actually found an internship and uh, so that was with a national accounting firm they hired me on, uh, you know, as an intern, and I did that for a few months, and then they did offer me a full-time job there. Um, but prior to that, and then even, you know, when I did, uh, you know, get my current position with St. Leo, definitely have had more interviews than I can count, um, you know, both, you know, by phone and in person. Um, I would say the biggest kind of thing that I've learned over time and it's, you know, it's not always a surefire way. It's certainly not going to guarantee you a job, but it can certainly help your, you know, your chances of landing employment. And then the big thing is communication, just being able to communicate, you know, who you are as an individual. And then obviously, if you have a disability, what specifically that disability is and what you're able to do in order to kind of work around that disability to complete whatever tasks or, you know, job duties are required for a job. Yes. Um, so I, I will say I did have one experience um, with this one interview I went to, <clears throat> and I did not, <clears throat> I did not, uh, you know, there, there was an initial phone interview before the actual face-to-face interview. And so it was with this guy, and I, I did not mention on the phone that I was visually impaired. And that, you know, I and came I, to find I, out. I, I <laughs> would ahead. say neither should you have to, you know. <laughs> right, right. I mean, I will say it, <laughs> I should have, you know, it, I, it may not have helped me get the job. I, I didn't get that particular job. Um, and I don't even know if having mentioned that on the phone necessarily would have helped. But when I did walk in for that face-to-face interview, you know, I had my white cane with me and was walking in and was in this lobby and then the guy came out, you know, the person that was going to interview me and he was just shocked. He really was kind of speechless. He didn't know how to really even communicate. I mean, he said, Oh my gosh, you have a white cane. So you're blind and literally started asking me, you know, just standing in this lobby before we ever sat down anything He was like, you know, so how can you use a computer? How can you do this? How can you do that? And I honestly really didn't know what to say. I mean, I had never been, Mm -hmm. you know, basically attacked. I mean, that's a strong word, but I feel like I was pretty much attacked and just, you know, before, before, like I said, before we ever sat down, before there was any kind of chance for a rapport to be established. Yes. And, you know, I know that's, you know, it's it definitely was an outlier. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of ignorance out there. People don't necessarily know how to, you know, immediately interact with someone who's visually impaired or a number of different disabilities that someone might have. Um, but it really did strike me as like, wow, you know, this this is probably as, as bad as it's you know going to get in, in mm. that type of setting. And so just to kind of finish that story, you know, we did eventually sit down at a table and and did chat. And, you know, I felt like I I did as well as I could as far as, you know, kind of making my case, so to speak, which, again, I don't think I really should have had to, you know, to do. You know, it should have just been a, a, you know, a, a fairly just, you know, easy back and forth conversation as any job interview really should be. 
but I knew, you know, as soon as that initial interaction occurred in the lobby of that building, I knew there was zero chance that I had of getting that job. It just, it totally, you know, there was nothing I could say. There was nothing I could do to convince that individual, yeah. you know, to hire me because I could tell immediately that there was this level of total discomfort and just lack of awareness, lack of understanding. And it just, it really, you know, it really threw me off. I mean, it, <laughs> It well, just, there's really there's really no legal recourse at the end of the day. I mean, you could go and get an employment attorney and and go after someone, but I you probably wouldn't want to work for, with someone like that, you know? Exactly, and that was the thing. It really became a mutual, you know, lack of just, you know, again, no rapport, no relationship that was ever going to work there, whether I wanted it to, yep. whether he would ever want it to or not. So. Yep. I think you had another interview that uh, you uh, told me about where uh, their job description uh, um, was set for like a content writer or social media writer, but it, it, they, they omitted some other qualifications that uh, they were looking for until they got to the interview and saw you and then kind of put that on to you at that interview. Um, I believe it was like Photoshop or something like that. Can you talk more about that and how that kind of arose and how you maybe navigated around that? Yes. Yeah, I do remember that particular case. And it, uh, you know, like you said, the <clears throat> what they were looking for, what they were advertising for was totally within my abilities. And, you know, if if there was anything maybe that wasn't, you know, it was easily something somebody else, you know, could have helped me do or whatnot, you know, at that particular job. And so I do remember going for that initial interview and it, you know, it, it did go well. It was a panel interview and I thought it went very well. And I actually was called back for a second interview and, you know, they might've briefly mentioned the, you know, it was some kind of graphic design or working with photos, maybe even just like organizing photos or whatnot something visual related to that, you know, to that job. And uh, so the second interview comes along and, you know, I'm definitely excited because I, at that point, had had, you know, quite a few interviews before that and had never had a second interview. So I'm thinking, hey, I got a really good chance here. You know, I must be one of the top three candidates, let's just say. And so I go in for the second interview and, you know, the main conversation is about this visual aspect of the job and it was never you know might have been briefly mentioned or, or mm -hmm. brought up in that initial panel interview but it was never you know there, there was never any indication that okay maybe this is something that greg wouldn't be able to do or any kind of concern expressed on their part yeah and so in that second interview it you know, that was pretty much the main focus of, okay, you know, basically we're going to hire you only if there's some way, shape, or form that you can do this visual task. You know, we know you can do everything else, but, you know, is, it, is there any way at all that you can do this visual task? And, you know, I, I tried to express the fact that, yes, you know, even if I couldn't do it necessarily myself or do the whole thing myself, mm -hmm with a little accommodation, it would be a pretty simple fix, something that, you know, maybe a coworker or whatnot could step in and, and help with that. And it would be, you know, we'd be able to make it work basically. And so I, you know, I thought I, again, made my case and came across pretty well and was, uh, you know, left with a, a rejection email after that second interview. Yeah, so kind of the, the it kind of prejudiced the uh, conversation by kind of throwing that on to you, and uh, maybe they wouldn't have focused on that as much as in detail if someone walked in there that was you know fully you know, had, had their full vision, and I, I I would probably venture to argue that that task uh, on the you know skill to zero to 100 percent only probably in, in entailed probably like two or three percent of that job where they base that completely on you know some type of uh, uh of disability that would prevent you from doing that you know two or three percent portion of that job exactly yeah and it's just a situation like that where it's just so frustrating you know someone in my shoes 
Yeah. Thinking, okay, you know, I can do, even if it's, let's just say, 90% of this job, you know, with a little accommodation, a little assistance, you know, nothing crazy at all Mm -hmm. for them to be able to help me, you know, get to that 100% mark. Mm -hmm. And they just, you know, for whatever reason, were not willing to, to provide that accommodation and take me on for it. Okay. So what I, from, from my vantage point, you know, growing up with a a disability and, and, you know, waking up every day and, and going that, you know, putting my legs on and and walking around for the first 10 minutes is going to hurt. Uh, Kind of what goes through your mind when you get up? How how do you deal with, uh, you know, tackling each day, you know, and and knowing that you're going to face adversity or face something that, you know, you're going to have to overcome and, uh, you know, what what drives you? Yeah, I will say, you know, fortunately, I've kind of learned over time and I'm still learning. I mean, I feel like we're all learning every day something to kind of improve our lives or just find a better way to do whatever it might be. Um, you know, in my case, transportation is, is definitely a big uh, challenge. And, uh, you know, just never having been able to drive, you know, having to rely on others, you know, to get me to where I need to go. Um, so, you know, I would say just transportation to and from work. I do work in an office, so I do have to be there at a certain time and leave at a certain time and, you know, fortunately, over time, I've made connections, let's say, with my current job, um, with coworkers or neighbors or just folks who live, you know, in the area, you know, to be able to find reliable transportation. But there definitely are days where, you know, I might have a driver scheduled and for whatever reason, I never hear from them. And especially in the morning, you know, when you obviously kind of have your your morning you know, outlined in your mind about, okay, this is what I'm going to do this, you know, I'm going to get ready and then I'm going to walk out the door and they're going to be there to pick me up. And there have been several times where that has not happened. And it's like, whoa, you know, this, (laughs) I got to get to work. You know, what do I do next? Who do I call? You know, if I try calling the driver, okay. You know, occasionally they'll pick up and they'll say, Hey, you know, I forgot about it. Something came up, blah, blah, blah. You know, either I'll, I'll be able to come in a few minutes or can't come at all, or, you know, I'll call someone and they won't answer at all, text them, nothing, and it's just radio silence. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, then it's like, all right, you know, let me call a taxi, let me call an Uber. Um, and it's it can be very frustrating. And I will say, you know, situations like that, it it does throw off your whole day. I mean, it's, you know, to some it may not seem like much and... Fortunately, where I work, they're not too strict on, you know, when I necessarily get to the office or whatnot, but uh, it's it's still aggravating and it does still kind of linger in your mind even as the day goes on. And it's like, you know, you like I said, you kind of have this this outline in your mind about, OK, here's what I'm going to do today and here's where I'm going to be. Here's where I have to be at this time and that time. And if it doesn't go right, it just, it can be very frustrating. So, <laughs> Yes, yes. <clears throat> I know that, um, yeah, you, you get around awesome. I know that some counties, uh, we both lived in uh, the same counties, basically, Pinellas and Pasco. And I know some counties have... Um, uh, much more sophisticated infrastructure in terms of dealing with uh, uh, people uh, that are have mobility issues in terms of you know not being able to drive a car or, you know, or whatnot. Uh, can you talk to me about um, what you see the differences are um, and maybe I think we we grew up pretty much in an urban area, um, but we do have a lot of infrastructure around and then we moved out to a um, kind of I would say a country area and those those challenges that you kind of talked about earlier uh, are, are, are adversely you know affected by where you live right definitely yeah um, you know public transportation obviously is something that so many people rely on if you know someone can't drive for whatever reason that may be 
And uh, so I will say in Pasco County, where I currently live, uh, the public transportation is limited. It's, you know, there are there are buses, there are, you know, certain forms of, of that transit, but it's very limited, especially where I do live in the county. And uh, that there also are, you know, these paratransit services, which is basically a door-to-door, you know, almost like a taxi or an Uber service that the county provides at a very low cost, you know, to the to the rider. And unfortunately, in Pasco, that's also very limited. They only take you to what they call life-sustaining trips <laughs> or, you know, on life-sustaining trips, which does not include work. And I would argue that, hey, you know, in order to sustain and maintain, you know, uh, wherever you're living or, or whatnot, I mean, you kind of need income and you kind of have to, you know, it is a life-sustaining activity, going to work every day and, yeah. and doing that. So. You know, that's definitely a challenge. Um, whereas Pinellas County, um, where I, I do occasionally go uh, to my parents and, uh, you know, still I am still a member of this DART program, which is also a paratransit service. And so with the DART program, they will take you literally all over the county anywhere for four dollars and fifty cents i mean one wow. way and it's and we're talking you know 30 probably 35 miles from north to south it's a long county so that's pretty good yeah and they're really i mean there are a few limitations on bus routes and you know if you live within a certain distance of a bus route maybe they won't pick you up here or there there are some limitations but in general it's it's pretty good i mean then you know it's seven days a week there are certain hours it's not a 24-hour service but uh you know it's it's again they would take me to work they would take me you know to the bowling alley to a restaurant to a bar you know any friends have i mean yeah. literally a doctor's appointment <laughs> and so that you know unfortunately there are you know quite a few counties out there that are more populated do offer a service like that but there are counties like pasco and a number of others where it's just so limited and you know can be very challenging especially if you are working and you know have a regular place to go throughout the week yeah i i to give a little bit of understanding to our, our viewers and listeners here um I, the density of pinellas county is very dense it's pretty much built out whereas pasco county is more rural uh uh kind of the if we look at a map, we have uh, Pinellas and Hillsboro that are kind of on the same uh, county line, if you will, on a, um, a latitude, uh, latitude, uh, latitudinally speak, speaking with each other. And Pasco is above both of those counties. So as urban sprawl grows out, we have um, more and more building happening in southern Pasco and more the western side of Pasco, but there's a lot of farmland, a lot of a lot of open spaces over on the eastern side of Pasco where uh, Dade City is and St. Leo. So, um, I, I I would think that probably the revenue of of um, you know as as houses get developed, the taxation revenue probably will increase, and they will probably be able to build more infrastructure. Uh, going forward so it's not uh, I think maybe you would agree it's not necessarily knocking Pasco but it's I think it's a um, a revenue issue in the long run uh, being able to sustain you know uh, travel long distances where you have a county that is, is is very separated absolutely yeah yeah and like you were saying pasco it definitely has its, its pockets of population and continues to grow pretty rapidly in certain areas but it is it is much more spread out and whereas pinellas you do have you know people pretty much everywhere from head to toe so to speak throughout the county um and yeah it's you know i certainly can't blame or or say anything negative against you know, any location, you know, city, county, whatever it may be, um, because obviously, you know, they're, you know, doing what they can with the money and the revenue that they do have to provide those services. Yeah. Um, and like I was saying before, you know, fortunately, I have made quite a few connections. So, 
you know, living in such a rural area like Dade City, I feel like if I can make it there, you know, I can make it anywhere, kind of to borrow a Sinatra line. There, so. Yeah, it's a good litmus test of being able to see if you can <clears throat> self-sustain in an area that is, is pretty rural. Um, and basically, you could, like you said, you could live anywhere if, if you could live there. Uh, maybe not like, you know, rural mountaintop Alaska, but, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Obviously within a little reason here. You yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. And I will so, say, you know, my goal is to eventually wind up in a place where I can take, you know, buses, subways, public transit, and not necessarily have to rely on just, you know, private individuals or even taxis, which can be really expensive. Yeah. Um, or even Uber and Lyft, which, hey, I mean, it's it's certainly a, a reduced rate compared to what you might pay for a taxi or or that kind of thing, but can still add up. I, I would venture to say that uh, uh, Uber or Lyft don't really have any programs for rural passengers like yourself. And that might be an area that, you know... Um, from a, a publicity standpoint, a PR public relations standpoint, that they could offer um, a reduced rate for you know people in rural areas uh, that have mobility issues that qualify. Definitely, I think that could be a huge market for them um, because hey, let's face it, even though this you know this country has what 325, 330 million people in it there's still many areas that are rural and just are not connected very well at all, you know, if at all to public transportation. And so, yeah, that would be, you know, really, a really good potential down the road. Yep. Well, we're coming up on uh, one hour here and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna close this out. I, I appreciate you uh, coming on my show and um Greg, I appreciate you uh, being long-term friends, and uh, you know we'll we'll get together for another beer one day, and uh, hopefully we can uh, just uh, hopefully this has been educational to the uh, listeners and viewers here, um, and and what it is like to uh, go day to day with a disability uh, and kind of navigating your way through through life, and uh, I appreciate your time, Greg. Likewise, very well said. Thanks, Joe. Greg, uh, how can we uh, hear more about you and hear more interviews on your uh, podcast? Sure, yeah. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Greg the Writer. That's at G-R-E-G-T-H-E-W-R-I-T-E-R. And then you can also just Google Eyes Free Sports. So that's E-Y-E-S and then F-R-E-E, two words, sports. And uh, find that on your favorite uh, podcast app.